Hello, welcome to Layers with Larry. I'm Larry, and these are all my layers. Hi, welcome back to Layers with Larry. Um, today we're gonna go way up, way up the top of the layers and uh, a little above the Willwood Formation, which we, we spent on a previous video. Uh, also in Eocene time, we're talking about a time about 45 million years ago or so, um, the youngest rocks that have been deposited around the Bighorn Basin, mostly deposited in the west. So when you, um, when you go on a trip to Yellowstone, you drive through the canyon, and you start going up the North Fork, you start noticing all that brownish, reddish sort of rock and the, and, the, and the spires and really beautiful rock formations. All of that stuff is part of a huge, huge group of rocks called uh, the Absorca Volcanics. And they were erupted out of volcanoes uh, that existed um, all around the west side of the current Bighorn Basin. Um, they don't have anything to do with Yellowstone. Uh, these rocks, these volcanic rocks that we're gonna be talking about today um, were deposited 40 million years before the Yellowstone was in its present position. And that's a subject for another video. So when you've seen those rocks from far away, unless you get off the road and, and walk up to the, the exposures, you really don't know what they're composed of. And they're, they're highly variable. Um, these volcanoes, these super volcanoes that existed during Eocene time uh, erupted out uh, lava flows that, that you know, like you've recently seen in, um, in Iceland. Uh, fast moving lava like basalt. Uh, basalt, there's an example of basalt. One way you can identify that is by noticing all of these little open spaces in here. Um, those, were, those were spaces that were filled with gas. They're like bubbles in the rock. So when the rock quickly hardened, uh, the gas bubbles were trapped in there. Uh, so that tells you something about, uh, you know, sometimes magma or molten rock cools way deep underneath the surface of the earth. Sometimes it comes out on the surface and cools very, very quickly. When it cools super, super quickly, it forms obsidian. It doesn't have time to form crystals. Um, and so it's, it's volcanic glass. Uh, the same basalt over time after it's buried in, in the earth, uh, those gas, those, those little bubble spaces uh, can get gradually filled in with minerals. In previous videos, we talked about how uh, groundwater picks up silica and dissolves it essentially like dissolves glass, quartz, and when it finds the right conditions of pH and temperature and pressure and all that sort of stuff, um, minerals can start to deposit inside these little gas spaces. Here's an example of a piece of basalt, and we don't see any of those bubble or empty bubble spaces because they have been filled in with, um, with minerals, with silicate minerals. Uh, way up on Carter Mountain, for example, there are layers of this basalt where there are gas bubble pockets that are like this big. And so the inside surface of those starts to get those minerals depositing, and as they do, they form crystals, and they gradually work their way inward. Sometimes when we find them, they haven't completely filled in, and examples are like this here. Here's a, a piece of material that includes crystals of a mineral called analcyme. And uh, this is very, some of the best examples of minerals called zeolites that are found anywhere in the world, actually, and they're right up on Carter Mountain. Even from far away, you can probably see all the, the sparkly nature, all the nice little crystal facets, quite beautiful. Um, they're just whitish or clearish, and some get quite large. This is one individual crystal of analcyme from a, a large pocket uh, in the basalt. Now, now basalt um, you know, cools very quickly on the surface, and so as I say, there's no time for crystals to form. Basalt contains several different minerals, but uh, they're all mixed together, and when they cool, they just solidify like that. But if, um, if a magma is uh, not exposed on the surface and doesn't cool quickly, but instead is trapped deep underground, um, that cooling process will take time. And while it's still semi-molten or molten, the different minerals, well, just like in, when you make rock candy, uh, you take a bunch of sugar and put it in water, heat it up, so you have more sugar dissolved in that volume of water than it really should be able to hold. But at a high temperature, it can hold more. When it cools down, those sugar molecules want to get out of solution. They want to join together and form crystals. So we put a little, a little um, like a seed or a nucleus for them to do at least like a, a string hanging uh, with something hanging at the end. And once the crystals uh, or once the sugar molecules start to form together into crystals, then they grow on each other and form the beautiful little crystals. Well, here's kind of the same thing on a, on a geologic scale. This is chemically the same material as the basalt. We don't really see much in the way of gas pockets. There's some, but not very many. But we do start to see these 
dark and in some cases light little crystalline structures, and those are different minerals that had time to grow. Uh, and you don't have to go up the North Fork to see them. You see them all around Cody. All of the gravel layers that you see are all material that eroded out of those absorcal volcanics, got tumbled together in rivers and, and uh, glaciers and, and brought down and deposited into thick layers in the riverbeds. And, uh, and most of the rocks that you find there are the volcanic rocks, some are quite, quite beautiful. And when these volcanoes erupted, uh, some of you are old enough, like myself, to remember the eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State. Um, when Mount St. Helens erupted, uh, the mountain was covered by glaciers. Uh, it blew not just rock and, and, and you know, lava and the ash and stuff out of itself, but it melted all of that ice on top and all that mixed with the previous rock and the ash that was coming out and flowed down the sides of the mountains in huge uh, debris flows. Um, so you get bits of previously existing volcanic rocks mixed with you know, muddy sort of sized particles, silt particles all mixed together and then uh, running down the hillside eventually to the point where it would slow down and stop and you get a deposit that's just a mishmash of all kinds of stuff. Well, we see that up in the Absorc of Volcanics as well. Here's a good example of it right here. Um, if we look carefully, you'll see um, bits and pieces. They're not individual crystals like we saw in this specimen. They're actually pieces of various bits of, organic, or of, of, of volcanic rock that formed at different places at different times and were caught up in that huge debris flow um, down the hillside. Uh, and as it did, a lot of times this stuff plowed over forests just like it did in Mount St. Helens. And in this case, uh, we know that for sure because not only is this hardened debris flow of mud and, and various volcanic rock and stuff present, but if you notice, uh, when I picked this up, I got a delightful surprise in that uh, here's a piece of the uh, metasequoia wood that it picked up along the way from the forest that got destroyed by the volcano. Not burned up. Uh, this is not like lava. This is just volcanic debris and, and picked up the wood and preserved it because by being covered in now hundreds of feet of volcanic debris rich in silica, and eventually groundwater would move through there, move that silica, and as we've just described in previous videos, all of the microscopic detail that the wood can get preserved in the form of silica. Here's another really good example of that. It shows even more clearly the, um, the sort of conglomerate looking material. It's known as a breccia, actually, a technical term, but it basically means uh, it's made up of fragments of bits and pieces of rock, debris, and mud uh, all mixed together. And uh, this was a neat piece that I found. It's not as cool just because of the way it is, but when I broke it open, um, got another nice, lovely surprise here with a, um, a branch or a stem of a probably met a sequoia uh, tree branch, and it was pressed kind of flat and silicified in place. Sometimes um, the, the flows are very fine material. You might see this and think it's sandstone, and it actually has particles in it that are like mm, size of you know very tiny bits of sand and, and such, but it's part of a debris flow, and it clearly picked up a, uh, a little hitchhiker as well. And I'll show you a close-up. I mean, it's so well-preserved, you can even see the individual rings and count the number of years, how old this, uh, this stem was uh, 45 million years ago. Sometimes when those bits of wood and sticks and twigs get picked up in the volcanic material, they don't get pressed flat like the one we just saw a moment ago. Instead, they may be very intact, three-dimensionally, you know, uh, see here, here's a piece of a, a branch or a stem. But if you look on the side, you'll see there's no indication of any rings. It doesn't look like wood. If anything, it looks like an agate. Uh, and it actually is. <laughs> um, if I put a light up to this like we did the previous one, you'd see light transmitting through it very nicely. There's no preserved wood here. What happened in this case was that the piece of wood was buried in the volcanic material, but over time the wood just eventually dissolved and rotted away and it never got preserved as fossilized wood. Instead it was just a cavity that had a perfect image of the outside of the piece of wood preserved in the rock, but inside there was just an empty cavity. But over time that gradually filled up with microcrystalline quartz, which is the fancy word for an agate, and, um, and it's a beautiful agate. Uh, but the outside surface, you can see, retains the, the structure or the shape of the outside of the stem. You can see the, the sort of striated nature of the, the wood-like material. That's called a limb cast, and that's something you could find in the gravel deposits around Cody if you uh, keep your eyes open and know what you're looking for.
Sometimes in these volcanic eruptions, uh, material gets blown out, ash-sized particles that are actually almost more like little grains of sand. And uh, in, be in between eruptions, their forests will regrow, and uh, there's a very fertile place to grow on the side of a volcano, for example. Um, and, uh, and then after you get nice established forests, Again, we can get these huge flows of material. We can get the sand-sized stuff coming down in rivers and streams on the side of the volcano. And there's going to be little depressions, like little ponds and lakes, where tr leaves and, and bits of the, the forest can end up in there, just like in any lake today. And at the bottom of that, some of these, uh, these fine materials can start to accumulate, almost like a, a sand or like a silt material, like a sedimentary rock but it's made out of volcanic rock. That's kind of weird. And you wouldn't expect to see delicate things like leaves and, and delicate bits of branches in, in volcanic deposits. But here's an example right here. This is off of Carter Mountain. This is clearly a sandstony-like material. It feels like sandpaper. And look what you can see preserved all inside there. There's bits of branches, there's bits of leaves, and these, this is preserved in what's known as a volcanic sandstone. That's pretty bizarre. What you're mostly familiar with are the big, nice pieces of fossilized wood that you often see up the North and South Fork and sometimes even out in the Bay, Bighorn Basin. This can be so well preserved with silica that you even get things like the, the knots where a branch came out preserved. Here's another one here. And even the interior um, microscopic detail of the tree is well preserved. Again, probably a meta sequoia tree. So from, from above, Let's go take a look over here for a minute. Here we see a geologic map. And if you're not very familiar with them, that's okay. Uh, we have a short little video we're going to do uh, about geologic maps if you're interested in that. But from this one, you can see or get oriented real quickly. You can see Buffalo Bill Reservoir. So that gives you an idea where you are. Town of Cody is going to be over here. And this is the road uh, or up the Shoshone Canyon here and then up the... North Fork, uh, up, to, uh, up to Yellowstone. Um, to make a long story short on this map, all the colors refer to different geologic formations, but now we're, when we get into the west side of um, the basin, it's almost all volcanic rock, and that's indicated by this, this uh, pinkish color. Um, this, is, uh, this is all uh, volcanic material. This is all part of the Absarca volcanics. And as you drive up the North Fork, you sometimes will notice, especially like just past Wapiti, you start seeing them. You'll see these, um, these linear features, which are known as China walls. Uh, but notice these black lines. These are representing these, these China walls. And if, if you look over here, you see almost a kind of a circular feature that has radiating lines like that. And these are all China wall equivalent things. What that represents is, well, remember, this, this, this is a volcano. This is called a sunlight volcano. It doesn't look like much of a volcano now because it erupted last time it erupted. It was about 40 million years ago. But it used to be uh, as high as Mount Fuji is today in Japan. And um, if you were around 45 million years ago standing where Cody is now, well, you wouldn't be standing where you were stand now in Cody because Cody was covered as well as the whole basin was covered with several thousand feet of material, so you'd be standing on a big flat plain, and the future Cody would be 3,000 feet below your feet. But if you look to the west, you would see this massive straddle volcano. And, and when those volcanoes erupt, they could push upward on the land surface. Imagine a balloon, and you painted it with paint, and you let the paint dry. And then you blew the balloon up, just like blowing the land up underneath here. As the balloon tried to expand, it, the balloon would expand, but the paint can't. Instead, it would form cracks all around it. And it did. And these cracks were filled with magma that came up from below. Big vertical sheets of magma. And over time, as the volcano has eroded away, some of the rocks in the volcano were soft, some of them were very hard. In the case of this magma that came up through these cracks, it's quite hard. And so it resists being eroded, but the rock around it gets eroded away. And so you get these vertical features exposed. Kind of reminded the early settlers of the, like the Great Wall of China, so they call them China Walls. And let me just end with um, one really, I think, really beautiful piece of of this uh, abstract volcanic material. So this is a piece of um, essentially basalt 
type material. There's some little gas pockets in there. Um, but when the basalt came flowing down the mountain, of course, it, in, it, in, it often in, ran into rocks that were pre-volcanic, that were there before, and some very, very old. In this case, it picked up a beautiful piece of chert, um, which is chemically the same thing as an agate. But look at the beautiful colors in there. So this was a little chert pebble that was part of a river system someplace. And when the volcano or the volcano erupted and the basalt lava flows came down the, the hillsides, it picked this little guy up and being silica, it didn't get melted or re reformed and reshaped. It just got encapsulated in the, in the volcanic rock, in the, in the lava. So. I hope that uh, gives you a little more information about volcanic rocks in the area and how to identify them and where they came from. And uh, you know, get out there and get out there and check them out. <laughs>